The date is the 27th of October, 1789. A man is walking to an Austrian encampment, just outside of the town of Turnhout. The battle was a huge success. The Belgian rebels had successfully managed to drive the Austrian armies from the siege of the town. This was the first battle of what would later be called the Brabant Revolution. How did this happen? Why were the Belgians rebelling against the Austrians? Didn't Belgium gain independence from the Netherlands in 1830? To answer all of these questions, we need to talk a little bit more about the state of Europe during the late 18th century. In the late 18th century, the feudal systems of the Ancien Regime were starting to lose their power. This ultimately culminated into the French Revolution in the spring of 1789. This revolution shook the foundations of the European powers at their cores. Ideas from the Enlightenment, like civil rights, the right of self-determination and freedom began to circulate around the globe. Some of these ideas managed to sneak into places where one would least expect them to be. Part 1. The Austrian Netherlands Throughout the centuries, the southern low countries, most of modern-day Belgium and Luxembourg, had been in the hands of the Habsburg royal family. After the Eighty Years' War created the Dutch Republic, the Dutch never managed to liberate the southern provinces from Spanish Habsburg rule. Good news though, the Spanish Habsburgs are gone! Now the lands are in the hands of the Austrian Habsburgs. Wait a minute, really? Ah, piss. Therefore, the southern provinces were called the Austrian Netherlands. Now, for the most part, these provinces had managed to maintain a large degree of autonomy. The states were largely dominated by the estates of Brabant, not to be confused with the Dutch province of North Brabant, and the state of Flanders. It should also be noted that the southern low countries had always been very Catholic, as opposed to their Protestant and later reformed northern counterparts. The clergy still played a large role in everyday life. Enter Joseph II. Surprisingly, for Hatsburg, he had quite liberal views. Liberal for the time period at least. He was a proponent of the idea of enlightened absolutism. Basically, an absolute monarch who governs based on the principles of the Enlightenment, governing for the subject's well-being. So to follow this idea, he began pushing reforms on the Austrian Netherlands. These reforms included centralization, much like Philip II had done in the Northern Netherlands about two centuries earlier, and taking away privileges from the clergy. This did not go over very well. The reforms were very unpopular with the higher and middle classes of the region. The ruling classes were still very traditional and saw this as an attack on their social order. The majority of the population, mostly influenced by the church, believed these reforms to be a threat to their own cultures and traditions. As a result, a lot of unrest happened, like riots and pamphleting. This discontent turned into a small wave of uprisings known as the Small Revolution of 1787. The revolution was suppressed, but it shocked the Austrian governor generals. It showed to them that the Austrian army currently stationed in the region was unable to suppress a large revolt. Eventually, the reforms were halted for a short period of time. This, however, was done without the Emperor's permission, and he was furious. As a response, he recalled his minister from the region and began thinking about a compromise. Eventually, he agreed to halt most of his reforms except the ones imposed on the clergy. He had hoped that by dividing the social classes, he would have been able to prevent a revolt. Unfortunately for him, it did not. 
Part 2 Organization and Disagreements As a result of the meddling of the Emperor, the estates of Eno, or Henegouwen, and Brabant were disbanded. These were the states where the most opposition had been, and a new minister that was appointed had decided that the only way these reforms could be pushed through was by uncompromising enforcement. Obviously, this new minister did not get the memo that the Austrian army was incapable to suppress a revolt. One of the main organizers of the small revolution was a lawyer named Henri van der Loot. He had been called upon by the estates of Brabant to defend their position, and he was very much against the reforms, seeing that he was quite conservative. Fearing for his safety, he fled across the border, into the Dutch Republic, into exile. Here, he lobbied with the Dutch stadtholder William V to support the overthrow of the Austrian regime and install William's son Frederick as a stadtholder of a Belgian Republic. Not wanting a war with the Austrians, William said, um, a no. But van der Noot then set up his headquarters in the city of Breda, where he grew a faction of Amigre. It should be noted that the Dutch population was generally sympathetic to their cause. Meanwhile, in the Austrian Netherlands, the lawyers Jan Frans Funk and Verloy formed a secret society to plan an armed uprising against Austrian rule. As you did back in the day. Most of the revolutionaries they attracted were moderates and liberals, whom did not object to Joseph reforms, but whom had been levied from their lands without consultation. On the eve of the revolution, the situation was as follows. We have two main factions, one inside the Dutch Republic and one inside the Austrian Netherlands. Both oppose Austrian rule. However, these factions are also ideologically opposed toward each other, one being deeply conservative and the other being very liberal, their only common goal being to get rid of the Austrians. The clergy, seeing factionalism coming from a kilometer away, decided it would be best to unite all the opposition factions under a single union. They called themselves the Brabant Patriot Committee, or Brabant Patriotisch Comité. After some shifting of commanders and loyalties, the committee agreed that the revolution should begin in October of 1789. The conservative van der Noot had the Amigre army. To assist them, the liberal van der Vonk sent the retired army officer Jean-André van der Mens to lead that army. Part 3 Revolution That spring, all hell broke loose in France and the French Revolution started. In August, the inhabitants of the neighboring Prince Bishopric of Liège overthrew the Prince Bishop and declared a republic in Liège. The French Revolution was a trigger for all kinds of revolutionary activity to commence, so it made sense for the Belgian factions to spring into action as well. On the 24th of October, the army of émigré patriots under Commander van der Mens crossed across the Campen region to the south of Breda across the border. In the town of Hoogstraten, the Patriots made their intention clear when they denounced the rule of Joseph II and declared that he no longer held any legitimacy over the Austrian Netherlands. On the 27th of October, the Patriot army clashed with a much larger Austrian army at the town of Turnhout. The Battle of Turnhout was a huge success for the Belgians and the larger Austrian army suffered a shameful defeat. Emboldened by this victory, many people across the Austrian army and across the states joined the Patriot cause. After this victory, several more battles were held at Ghent and later at Mol. By December, the rest of the Austrian force had been routed to the fortified city of Luxembourg and abandoned the rest of the territory to the Patriots. The regime was toppled. The revolution had been won. Yeah, long live the revolution! Now that the Austrians were gone, discussions began about what form the new revolutionary state should take. On the 30th of November, a declaration of unity was signed between the states of Flanders and Brabant. On December the 20th, an actual declaration of independence was signed. 
a lot of discussions were held about the Constitution. These discussions pissed off many liberals since they were held behind closed doors and did not involve many of the people who made the revolution happen. Eventually, however, it was decided that the new constitution would be inspired by the Dutch Declaration of Independence, het Plakkaat van Verlatingen van 1581, and the American Declaration of Independence. Finally, on the 11th of January 1790, the United Belgian States was born. A sovereign congress was created in Brussels, which would act as a parliament for the whole union. With that said, a lot of the former states still had a lot of autonomy. Part 4. Factionalism and Betrayal Sadly, it is at this point that the story turns sour. With no external enemy to fight, the revolutionary groups that had been united in their opposition against Austrian rule soon turned against each other. The new state was polarized between two major factions. The first faction were the Vonkists. Named after Jan van Vonk, they were the more liberal faction, hoping to achieve more in terms of liberty, equality and popular sovereignty. They were opposed by the statists, not to be confused with the Dutch statist faction. These were the more conservative people, led by Henri van der Noot. In a way, they were reactionaries. They had used the revolution, or seen the revolution, as a means to counter the reforms that Joseph II and the Liberals had wanted. The two factions soon clashed over the composition of the Provisional Assemblies. A compromise was never reached, and after some violent reactions, the statists had forced the Vonkists out of Brussels. This would lead to a persecution of Vonkists known as the Statist Reign of Terror. Vonkists from all over the country were arrested and forced out of offices. Vonk himself and his supporters were forced into exile into revolutionary France into the city of Lille. Here they tried to gain support against opposition against the statists, but this was sadly in vain. Meanwhile, the neighboring Liège Republic, which was an ally of the new Belgian state, was condemned by the Austrians and was occupied by troops from their Prussian neighbor. Disagreements between the old Prince Bishop and the Prussians would lead to a Prussian withdrawal, and the revolutionaries managed to gain control again. With the Vonkists out of the way, the statists tried to gain support from foreign powers. They had realized that although the Austrians were tied up at the moment in their war with the Ottoman Empire, at some point they would be back, so they needed a strong ally. They had made several attempts to woo the Dutch Republic for support, but the Dutch government was not interested. They did manage to gain some support from the Prussian king Frederick Wilhelm II, and he sent some troops. However, he would need to withdraw these troops not too long after because of British and Austrian pressure. Part 5 The Holy Roman Empire Strikes Back Joseph II of Austria died in February of 1790. He was succeeded by his brother, Leopold II. Leopold proceeded to sign an armistice with the Ottomans and then prepared 30,000 troops to crush the rebellion. He also signed the Reichenbach Convention with Prussia. This allowed him to reconquer the Austrian Netherlands, provided that the local traditions were respected. He also offered amnesty to all the revolutionaries whom she would surrender to the Austrians. The Austrian army under Field Marshal Baron von Bender invaded the United Belgian States and encountered little resistance. Most of this was because the population was very discontent with the status rule and their infighting with the Vonkists. On the 28th of September, the Austrian army smashed into the statist army at the Battle of Fallemange, close to modern day Dino. After this Belgian defeat, the outcome of the invasion was clear to most people. Hainaut was the first to recognize the sovereignty of the Austrians, and then many other cities followed soon after. Namur was captured on the 24th of November, and the Sovereign Congress met one final time at the 27th of November to dissolve itself. On the 3rd of December, 1790, the Austrians accepted the surrender of Brussels, marking the end of the revolution. The United Belgian States 
had lasted barely a year. In its aftermath, a convention was held in Den Haag to decide what to do. It was decided that the Austrian Netherlands would revert back to its status quo from before the reforms of Joseph II. I suppose, in a sense, the statists got what they wanted. The Liège revolution was also crushed by the Austrians around the same time and its Prince Bishop was reinstated in January of 1791. The Vonkists in France would eventually join the French revolutionaries during their invasion of the Low Countries in the French Revolutionary Wars. However, their dreams of an independent Belgian Republic would never be realized. Part 6 The End Result In the end, what was the legacy of the short-lived state? Barely anyone remembers it from history, seeing it as just another revolution in a time period flush with them. I think that the most important thing the revolution did was give the people a taste of unity, a sense of self-determination. I think that this is also partly why the Belgian War for Independence from the Netherlands in 1830 happened. When the Dutch king, William I, pushed too hard with his tax policies and lack of Belgian representation, the Belgians revolted and actually managed to keep their independence this time. Many of the colors and symbols from the revolution also live on. A good example, the colors of the flag of the United Belgian States would later be reused in what, would, what is nowadays the flag of Belgium. The Brabant Revolution is also unique in that it was surprisingly a reactionary revolution. The statists were opposed to the ideas of the Enlightenment, which in contrast were the driving force behind the French Revolution. The Vonkists, of course, tried to push through their liberal ideas, but mostly got exiled or jailed for their troubles. I think that because the revolution was reactionary, that it was doomed to fail. The revolution was a top-down affair rather than a bottom-to-up revolution. Many of the lower classes had very little say in the affairs of the revolution and the entire thing was basically organized by the upper classes. It may not have been a very influential event like many of its contemporaries, but it was definitely a very interesting piece of history and one that partly laid the foundations of what would nowadays be Belgium. Now, I know that I did not really go into detail into some parts of the revolution, but that is mostly because I want this video to be an intro into this topic. This is not meant to be a grand historical essay, and I'm fairly, very unqualified to do that. Either way, I hope that this video was interesting and insightful, and I thank you all for watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah.